Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to Highland Presbyterian Church. My name is Allison Gibson. I am with the Lancaster Clean Water Partners, and we are so glad to see you today. I have a wonderful set of partner organizations that have made today possible. So I'd like to start off with thank yous. Thank you to you all for being passionate and being energetic about clean water, about native habitat, about hearing someone inspirational, and being part of a community in Lancaster that is prioritizing that. Thank you to the Kent Fields Foundation. They are the grant that is helping us with this, and they saw a vision and they support that for clean and clear water here in Lancaster by 2040, specifically working with senior living communities. Thank you to the Conservation District and the Conservation Foundation for helping us with that grant and being the house of the Lancaster Clean Water Partners. They have done years of work related to clean water and healthy soil here in Lancaster County. Thank you to Linford Good and the Friends of the Woods and Wetlands at the Landis Communities. They are pioneers for native habitat and they are mentors for the others working within senior living communities. Thank you to Linda Farrick and the Lancaster Conservancy for making native plants and the outdoors accessible and exciting. Thank you to Kelly Gutshaw and the amazing team at Land Studies. They are part of this effort from a business perspective. They are part of this effort from a leadership perspective, from a technical assistance perspective. And we are so grateful for their graphics, for the maps, for the support on so many different levels. Thank you for today's vendors. We talk about inspiration and hearing this message, but a message gains power, gains momentum when we all go take action. So our conservation partners that are here today are giving us those tools as you come in and then as you leave again so that you can take action based on what you hear today. And finally, thank you so much to Will Massey and our Earth Care team at Highland Presbyterian Church for being our spiritual guide for the dedication to our Earth, to our sustainable efforts that we, within the interfaith community, can keep working on as a community. We are so appreciative that they think big and they go for goals, like bringing in Dr. Tallamy as a speaker for today, and committing to that as a priority for, the, for us this year. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Will for a welcome to Highland. Welcome to Highland. Uh, my name is Will Massey. I'm the director for Youth Ministry and Mission at Highland. I have a couple things to say, but first I want to do, want to share a word of welcome from our pastor, Allison. Different Allison. Greetings from Highland Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Allison Bolyhu, the senior pastor here at Highland, and I'd like to welcome you to Highland Presbyterian Church. We are a member of the Presbyterian Church USA, and we are located in Mannheim Township, which is a suburb of Lancaster City. Highland Presbyterian Church began in 1957, and ever since then has been faithfully serving the Lord and reaching out to the community. Worship is the foundation of everything we do at Highland. Every Sunday morning, we gather at 10 a.m. to praise the Lord. Our worship includes diverse musical styles and engaging sermons that provide inspiration for the start of your week. Following worship, we spend time in fellowship in our large narthex, which has plenty of room for connecting with friends and meeting new ones. Our Christian education program involves Bible studies that meet in small groups, at times convenient for you. Our youth group meets almost every Sunday night from 4.30 to 6.30 in our brand new youth room, equipped with games and technology, as well as a coffee bar for kids to hang out and catch up with each other. There is Sunday school for the children during worship, and there is a well-equipped, well-staffed nursery that follows all safety measures to make sure our children are well cared for. Every second Sunday, we have events for families with children that are filled with fun and fellowship. We also host Upward Basketball for children kindergarten through fifth grade. This is a basketball league that focuses not only on providing for your child's physical needs, 
but for your child's spiritual needs as well. Mission and outreach are so important to us here at Highland, as we are very aware that we live in a world that is broken and in need. In this way, we partner with the Lancaster County Food Hub, Samaritan Counseling Center, Power Pack Projects, and Church World Service and Bethany Services. We recently ran a donation center for Afghan refugees in our area. I want to invite you to visit us here at Highland Presbyterian Church so you can see for yourself how the Spirit is moving here. Wherever you find yourself on your journey of faith, I guarantee that you will find friends here at Highland. God's peace be with you. What was not in there is that Highland is also an Earth Care Congregation, which is a program through the Presbyterian Church USA, the national church, uh, that has to do with our commitment to imperfectly uh, pursue these goals of being more sustainable and more loving of uh, the world and the creation. Uh, I will mention a couple bits of information. You'll see on the tables just outside of the doors here, there are uh, baskets for a, a free will offering. Um, all of those will go right back into the Earth Care Ministry at Highland that will allow us to do events like this in 2023 and 2024. So that's on the tables, as well as some additional information about what happens at Highland, including some special activities for uh, this month, for Advent. Uh, Highland can be found on uh, Facebook, of course, in addition to the info that's there. Otherwise, we hope that you can enjoy the presentation and you have something to encourage and inspire you today. Uh, and thank you, Allison, for her organization and leading our Earth Care team. Well, to all of you here in person, again, so grateful to have you. We have sold out today's event, and so a huge thank you to those of you joining us online and with the live stream. This will be recorded so you can come back and watch again and again and keep learning and keep being inspired. Because no further ado, we, I would like to bring up our guest speaker of the day. Dr. Doug Tallamy is the T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture at the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He's authored 106 research publications and taught insect-related courses for 41 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways that insects interact with plants and how, excuse me, how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. He is going to say so many things much more eloquently than I ever will, so I'm going to hand it off directly to him for today. Thanks very much, Allison. I told her to just say, here's Doug. She, she did. Look at all you people. Don't you know the World Cup's on? <laughs> there it is. Um, all right, I, I, I want to talk to you about uh, my idea of what nature's best hope is. And I'll give you a spoiler. You are nature's best hope. And it's an awesome responsibility. But let me tell you about why. Before I do that, though, let's talk about E.O. Wilson's idea of what nature's best hope is. Uh, is, was, he died the day after Christmas in 2022. So it's a huge loss to the world of conservation. Professor at, at Harvard, extremely long, productive career. Uh, one of the very best scientists we've ever produced. But one of the things that was consistent throughout his uh, very long career was his love of life, his efforts to save it. Not just because he loved it, because he knew that biodiversity was essential for our own future. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, our planet's fight for life, and he had one simple message, and that was, uh, if we don't save nature, if we don't save functional ecosystems on at least half of the planet, we're going to lose it on all of the planet. That includes us. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save life on half of planet Earth. Um, of course, to a, a conservation biologist, that's great news. We'll just put half the earth aside and every, every, our problems will be solved. The problem is half of terrestrial earth is already in some form of agriculture. 
and we've got eight billion people in the other half, along with all of our houses and agriculture and roads and detritus, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So, how could this be possible? That's basically what I want to talk about today. I do think we can do it. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation to do it. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened in 2019. Uh, on the East Coast, we had very large oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. That's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. But I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. Let me see my little, there, see it? Uh, first it chewed it, oh, oh, that's good. He's, okay. <laughs> He's coming out. <laughs> All right, there we go. He's chewing, chewing his way out. First he forced his head through there. Then he forced his entire body through there. It was a very tight squeeze. Kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it, it popped down. And that's a dangerous time for this insect lover because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. It takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. Within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa, and then surprisingly stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses, because it looks like they do, but their mouth parts, it's actually an extension of the head capsule, and their mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the egg turn around and lay an egg in it, and that is how the larva gets down there. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year the way most insects would? Well, uh, it takes uh, red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, there's a hole. It's kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she's filled it with three species of temnothoraxians. Tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they leave the acorn. And if scouts find a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it's time to, time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn. It takes about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard right there, make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until that acorn falls apart. So what's my point with this little story? That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays uh, are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn and they'll fly up to a mile, although I heard the other day, a mile and a half. A long way, they fly a long way from the tree. Uh, and then they tap the acorn beneath the soil surface. And the object is you're going to go back in the wintertime and, and get something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. <laughs> so for every four acorns they bury, they've actually planted three oak trees. Specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. <clears throat> so you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants. And you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andronophacelia, unless you have that plant, Facelia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees, and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head. Uh, I could. I could talk all afternoon, all night, all year about nature specialized interactions. The point I want to make today, though, is that uh, these interactions, nature itself, is on the ropes today. And it's on the ropes because we did not take uh, Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the uh, lower 48 states as it was. There's only about 5% of the country that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And those are typically mountaintops. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. 
We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland uh, in this country. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've, we've uh, paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. You can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need, because it is nature that keeps us alive on this planet. So you might wonder why we've done all that. <clears throat> I wonder why we've done that, and I don't know. But I suspect that we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large, we could foul it forever, and it wouldn't be any consequences, it'd be all right. But of course, we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here, what does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? We're talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost three billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. It's not a prediction. They're already gone. This is a prediction. The UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. And they said it two years ago. So now it's the next 18 years. You know, it makes a nice headline, but it's not an option, folks. These are the species that keep us alive on planet Earth. We have to make sure this doesn't happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, us upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk's about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Go well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects, and he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, those food webs would collapse and all those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? <clears throat> Remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Just a few things that plants do every day that we depend on, like produce oxygen, pretty important. Clean water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too, too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important today. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, building their tissues out of that carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon that they fix through photosynthesis into the soil through their root systems. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. And once it's in the soil, it's stable for thousands of years unless we turn over the soil again. Plants are building topsoil. They're holding it in place. They're preventing floods. They're dampening severe weather. They're converting sunlight to food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. That would be a challenge. What do animals do for plants? Lots of things. But important things include pest control surfaces. They're pollinating nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They're dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but it's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people that are demanding more ecosystem services every single day. Now we do have parks and we do have preserves and they're doing the best they can, but it's not good enough, which is why we are in the sixth great extinction event that the earth has ever experienced. So now we have to start to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like this. Now there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. 
One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been indigenous groups who've been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. They habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another place, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed that uh, we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land, we had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy the local ecosystem. That's what he called the land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sam County Almanac, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together, we cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, and unfortunately it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. And what I want to argue this afternoon is that not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. If we ignore private property, we're going to fail because most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. Got to practice conservation on private property. <clears throat> now, when you use the words conservation, I'm, I'm not being accurate. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left, absolutely, and that has been our, our uh, conservation model for the last century. Uh, but now we have to go beyond that. We've got to rebuild the parts of nature that we've dismantled, because we've done that in so many places. That's called restoration. And before you tell me, you're never gonna put it back exactly the way it was. I know that. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions that I opened the talk with to recreate functional ecosystems, even if it wasn't exactly what was on that, that spot at some point in the past. But not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally, so we have to start with the building blocks, the species that do uh, contribute the most. And there's two groups that we can't do without. One is the flowering plants, and of course the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into food, and that is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. But the energy is now in the plants. If we don't get it to the animals, we still don't have any animals. Well, it turns out that, that most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that eat plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects, and not just any insects. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of, of uh, plant eater. Which means if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, that is the chickadee, you know, you're right here on the, on the transition zone between Carolina chickadee and black cap chickadees. There's a little hybrid zone right, right very close to here. At my house, it's the Carolina chickadee because uh, I'm an hour south. <clears throat> They're all doing the same thing, practically the same bird. They're the birds at our feeders eating seed right now. We tend to think that's what chickadees need, seeds. Well, 50% of their diet during the winter time is seeds, but the other 50%, even in the winter time, is insects and spiders. And when it comes time to reproduce, their babies can't eat seeds. And that is true for most of the birds that are out there. They can't eat seeds, they can't eat berries, they have to eat insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they'll feed their, their babies exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young in insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. So how do I know that? Well, there's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my grad students, Ashley Kennedy, did a few years ago. She put out a call to bird photographers around the country and said, please take pictures of birds during the, the breeding season when they're carrying food to the nest and send those pictures to me, Ashley. I will identify all the prey items that are in the beaks of those birds and reconstruct the nestling diet 
for as many species of birds in North America as possible. And, you know, bird photographers don't need a lot of motivation to take pictures of birds. So. <laughs> she got thousands of pictures. It was great. She did a lot of identifying. And this is a summary of her results for the 20 most common bird families in North America. The green bars are the percentage of those bird families. Uh, the percentage of the nestling diet for those bird families, that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we landscaped in a way that didn't produce enough caterpillars? Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. What is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars, and one of them is that they're soft. So think of this guy as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. <coughs> The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's, it's made of chitin, it's undigestible. Uh, so the birds don't want a lot of, of undigestible material. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. They just stuff it down there like a plunger. <laughs> caterpillars are, are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our smaller birds do, do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible, and a lot of beetles have very sharp edges too, so you don't want to stuff that down your throat. Uh, and finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mention carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate, and birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, so we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. So where are the birds getting their carotenoids from during the bird breeding season? It's from all those things they're bringing back to the nest. But look, carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat the green leaves and that's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets a worm, but he doesn't get the carotenoids when he gets the worm. <laughs> so that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. They're essential parts of most bird species diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough? Or one or two a day enough? It's a good question. Let's go back to, to chickadees because uh, there's a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get them to the point where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, and then they become independent and continue to eat caterpillars. You're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to, to produce one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do because in so many places that's all we have, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they only forage about 50 meters from the nest. What's that? That's from here, a little past the wall over there. They're not flying very far from the nest because that takes too much energy and making so many trips each day. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not have all of those caterpillars nearby, and I don't want you to think that chickadees are exceptions because most birds are foraging very close to the nest. That's called insect decline, and it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major drivers of the bird declines that we're seeing. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that uh, says we've lost three billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups. The species that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects during uh, any part of their life history. So there are birds, things like finches and doves and crossbills, a few species that uh, can make a little milk out of seeds. And they, they do feed their babies seeds. So they don't require insects. And look, they didn't lose any numbers at all in the last 50 years. 
but the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. Does improve cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, we've asked them to be pretty. We're good at that. Uh, and we're not going to give that up. Now we have to ask it to be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. That's the challenge. And you're not going to make them ecologically functional unless you include caterpillars in these landscapes. So how do we do that? How do you add caterpillars to your yards? That's what we're talking about. You do that by putting the plants that support caterpillars in your yards. That seems pretty straightforward, but there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which plants we put in our yards. And we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the burning bush and all the hostas and all the ginkgos and all the calorie pear and all the things we typically landscape with from Asia in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's gonna make a monarch butterfly is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization and most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why? Because plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun, use it for their own growth and reproduction, so they do their best to protect their tissues. They load their, their leaves in particular with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that, that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me as you're walking out, go to that tree over there and grab a leaf and eat it. <laughs> See if you like it. <laughs> you're not gonna like it. Um, it's a very effective defense. It keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. Which is why it's green out there in the summertime. Not because there's no insects out there, but because they can't eat most of the plants. Uh, you know, there's a reason that kids won't eat their vegetables, they inherently know that they're toxic. <laughs> but we do know that insects eat plants, so how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insect species that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the plants for which they have specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those chemical defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. Behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect's locked into eating that particular plant. So, if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, the monarch's not going to start to make a living on your hostas. It has two choices then. Fly away and find milkweed someplace else, or starve to death. Turns out there's, there's, this is not very difficult. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs. Plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs. And plants that actively take it away, detract energy from local food webs. A good example, the best example of a contributor would be one of our oaks. They're contributing more energy to food webs across the country than any other tree genus. A good example of a non-contributor would be, be a ginkgo, ginkgo bilobar from, from Asia. Yeah, pretty ornamental plant, but nothing eats a ginkgo. Um, so it's there, but it's not contributing any energy to local food webs. And a good example of a detractor would be any one of our invasive ornamentals and bread for pear, calorie pear is a great example. They're not contributing very much energy at all, and they escape our yards and become serious invasive species, pushing out the plants that do contribute. So they're actively removing uh, energy from our food webs. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we don't pick the right plants, we are not gonna be able to successfully rebuild the food webs that support the ecosystems that we're trying to restore. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how easy or how well this does work when you do cho choose the right plants. And I'm gonna start with, with uh, my house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I should say our house, my, my wife likes to be included. <laughs> By the way, she said, as I was getting in the car, she said, you have to do a good job. These are nice people, you have to do a good job today. <laughs> when do I get to do a bad job? <laughs> All right, that's our house. That's what it looked like when we moved in the year 2000. Uh, 
It was a small farm in Oxford that was broken up into 10 acre lots, very old farm, had been farmed for, for 300 years, just about 300 years. The last thing they did was to mow it for hay, so just about all the plants were gone. Uh, so our goal was to, to you know, rebuild this, this ecosystem. Uh, and back in the year 2000, we didn't know a lot about how to do that, but I did know, I like caterpillars, so let's get some caterpillars back there. Let's see if we can get the Canadian outlet to start to make a living at, at our house. People say, why'd you choose the Canadian outlet? That's what one looks like, by the way. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet. Well, I was looking through Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America, and I said, that's a pretty one. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you're not going to have Canadian outlets unless you have Metaroo. It's a host plant specialist on Metaroo, just like monarchs are host plant specialists on milkweed. And we didn't have any Metaroo. No Metaroo anywhere around us. The entire area is farmed to death for uh, centuries. So I got some meadow seeds from someplace and I planted them. Uh, and they grew very nicely, but this was early on. And I actually had very little faith that Canadian outlets would appear out of nowhere and colonize my little patch of meadow So I didn't go out and check it after I planted them for at least two months. And then I was walking by for another, another reason. I looked over, it was covered with Canadian outlets. I'm still surprised about that. Uh, they had found it right away. Uh, so now I have a good population of meadow root and Canadian outlets. We've added two species to our ecosystem. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway, a beautiful orange moth. Uh, has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a misnomer. It's a specialist on that plant. Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. Now, I, we didn't have any Biden's aristosa. Uh, but I did know where there was some Biden's in a power line cut in Bear, Delaware, about 14 miles away. So I went and I got some seeds. And I planted them at home, and they grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, this year they took over my front yard. But that's okay, they're pretty. Uh, well, it took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my patch of bites, but they did, and now we have a good population of both the bidens and the, the goldenrod stowaway. So now we've added four species to the property. Wanted the hackberry emperor, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that ought to be on our, our property. But as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on, on celtus. We didn't have any hackberry. So I got a couple of hackberry trees, I planted them, they grew very nicely. Had to wait four years for the hackberry ember to find my hackberry, but it did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. We've added six species, and that's how the restoration went. I did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginopus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is one that has not come, the goldenrod flower moth. And that's what its caterpillars look like. I don't know why it hasn't come yet, uh, but it's still part of the fun, it's anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. <laughs> Every year I go out and I check my goldenrod at the end of the season. One of these years I'm gonna find it, and that'll be a great year. Mm, this is getting a little tired here. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear some people don't like Virginia creeper, but I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them. Uh, it makes uh, nutritious berries for the birds in the fall. And by nutritious, I mean they're high in fat. That's what our migrating birds need, high fat berries. Uh, and those berries came from tiny little inconspicuous flowers that are great for pollinators. You don't even know Virginia creepers in bloom until you see this cloud of pollinators, native bees around your, your Virginia creeper. Remember, when you're planting a pollinator garden, you were planting it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx flies that are a primary component of cardinal diets. Things like the Pandora sphinx, and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia Creeper. Want to see if I get the double tooth prominent at our, our property, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Looks like a Stegosaurus. <laughs> I mean, even if you don't like caterpillars, you've got to like this guy. Well, it's a specialist on elm, particularly American elm, and of course, we lost our elms to Dutch elm disease decades ago. But the two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die, and every year they make a lot of seed, so shortly after we moved in, I gathered up seeds from the gutter and planted them. They, they germinated in six days. They grow very quickly, uh, and now they're about 80 feet tall. And they did bring in the double-toothed prominent, another big success, American elm. 
wanted to get the evening primrose moth or see if I could get the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. But believe it or not, we didn't have any evening primrose, any enothera. So I planted that and the moth came, spends a day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's still very cute. And I planted lots of oaks. Now these are just examples of the plant lineages we put back on our, our property. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. That's the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say all the time, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't. <laughs> But if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, and remember, that's one of our goals here, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two-foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately, right away, they started to call in the moths, support the moths that make the caterpillars that run the food web at my house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered moth, the Suzuki's uh, promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange patch smoking wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the caterpillars on our, have come to the oaks, caterpillars come to the, that we planted at our house, and they come right away. This is a pinup that has just popped its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves at that tree. You do not have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to support your, your local food web. And, and I'm sure a bird came along and picked that off in short order. Okay, this is what, uh, if I stood in the same place I took that first picture, this is what our house looks like now. Um, that's actually where the Bidens invaded this, this year. Uh, so we put, we put plants back. Not all of them, we're still working on it. But my research has shown over the years that uh, those, those caterpillars I like are really important. That was a lucky coincidence. If you can't, and it's not just any caterpillars, it's moth caterpillars. Butterflies are bad tasting, day flying moths. And the reason they can fly during the day is that most of them taste bad. So they're not huge parts of, of local food webs. It's the moths that count. And if you count the number of species of moths in your local food web, you have a very good index of how stable that food web is and how productive that food web is. So, five years ago, I decided I would, I would try to do that. I'm gonna take a picture of every moth that's making a living at my house. I'm still doing it, but I'm up to 1,199 species of moths that are now making a living there, and believe me, they weren't there when I, when I started. Now, we've, we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania's 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land mass, we've got 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And because so many of them are, are uh, types of bird food, we've recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? This is another headline we see all the time. World Wildlife Fund says that Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, not at our house. <laughs> I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. Uh, it didn't take that long, and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. We just put some of the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We could turn this around. We really could. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. A lot of people don't have that much land. Will it work on smaller properties? Uh, that's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, they're in the middle of a development. Everybody around them has the big lawn. When they moved in, their yard was choked with bush honeysuckle, Amur honeysuckle, another serious invasive plant. So they got rid of that. They planted 70 species of native plants. They put in a water feature that they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard on their 0.6 acres, and they're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. If you're a birder, you know that's a very good number. Just to compare that to what we've seen in our house, we've only seen eight warbler species at our house so far. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. How about urban yards? 
Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago. Um, right on the other side of that wall is O'Hare Airport. She has one-tenth of an acre that's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. So she is a little island in the middle of Chicago. It's a pretty one-tenth of an acre because Pam is a landscape designer that uses native plants and she's good at it. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a little water feature, and then she sat back and she says, with a glass of wine, and counted the birds that are using her yard. And she's up to 124 bird species that have used her little tenth of an acre, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. It's sitting there. All right, there are four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. And we need to succeed in a, in a big way. Um, and one of them is we've got to shrink the area we've got in lawn. The figure now is about 44 million acres uh, of lawn. That's an area bigger than the size of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. And we know why we do that. It's a status symbol, and we need our status symbols. And we also need space to uh, display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? Let's say we've got 40 million acres and we cut it, cut it in half. What if we take plants or landscapes like that and turn it into that? I got this picture from Dan Getman. I've never met Dan Getman, but he's from Missouri. And he said, he said, I had this big lawn and I'm doing it. I'm putting all these plants back and I want you to see it. I said, great, I'll put that in my talk. Um, so Dan's doing it. Well, that would give us 20 million acres that we could put towards conservation right at home. In other words, we could create a new national park just by converting half of our, our lawn, and I'm calling it Homegrown National Park, and it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? What do we get when we put some part of nature right where we live? We get the opportunity to interact with it, to become friends with it, to have a relationship with Mother Nature. And we can do it at our own pace, our own time. All we have to do is go outside, or maybe even all we have to do is look out the window. We can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, last year, 375 million people there with you, I don't know how much nature you're going to see. But, uh, it's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes down the pike. No travel houses. You get to experience the natural world alone, which I think alone. That is the key to developing this personal relationship with Mother Nature, not, not uh, mediated by somebody else. And it's really important for our poor kids who happen to be the future stewards of the planet. They're suffering from nature deficit disorder. They don't even know what it is. And if they listen to the media, they're, they're terrified of it because everything the media says is terrifying. <laughs> so we're trying. We get 30 kids. We put them on a bus with a teacher, and they drive for an hour, and they, they go walk around a natural area for an hour, and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. <laughs> then they get back on the bus, and they, they drive home, and that's their experience with the natural world, which is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and get to know it, become friends with it, become unafraid of it, alone. No parental supervision. Let them work it out on their own. They will come home again. <laughs> you know, when we hover over our kids, we are sending the message that this is dangerous. You should be afraid. That's no way to get them to be good stewards of the planet. And, you know, we can't afford any more bad stewardship, so we've got to change our... our uh, the way we teach our kids about the natural world. Maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, <laughs> who lives in Hawaii on a very modest patch of nature. It's a little piece of grass with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And as soon as she discovered that, she sent me this picture to teach me how you catch lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. <laughs> then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you crawl towards the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of the lizard, you fall in love with that part of nature. You learn how to become a good steward of that part of nature. 
Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. <laughs> she sent me this picture not long ago, so who, who knows? But I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life, and that's going to help her be a good steward of the planet. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get uh, Nancy Strinisty's Nature Play at Home, dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can now do it. We've got a small nonprofit. Um, go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and register your property on the map. Uh, so it's free. This is, this is uh, simply a means of recording all the successful conservation that's happening on private property, and to encourage people who don't know their property is an important component of the future of conservation to do the same. When you do that, when you record the area you're taking care of, it's going to light up. Your, your part of the county is going to light up, and you get to see who else is doing this. We want, it to, we want that message that uh, you are responsible for good earth stewardship to go viral. So what are we asking? Yes, it would be great if you reduced uh, some of the lawn that you have, because lawn is not helping us out in any way. Uh, replace it with, with uh, natives, particularly the important ones. Remove invasives. Most people do have invasive species on their property, and they don't even know it. If you are protecting any natural areas on your property, we want to keep, keep protecting those areas. Our ecological product is significant increases in biodiversity. When you put these plants back, just like our property has shown, it, biodiversity increases. It also will be a significant contribution to drawing down atmospheric concert, uh, CO2. Your lawn is not doing that, but any other plant is going to be sequestering carbon dioxide. And it will build connections between existing preserves. In other words, create uh, biological corridors. Our sociological project is, is uh, national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solution is. We're the solution. We want to change the culture. We want to recognize, we want everybody to recognize that nature is not optional. It is, it's essential, and it's everybody's responsibility to taking care of it. It's also, that map is going to provide measurable progress towards the 3030 initiative. UN's, we're going to save 30% of the earth by 2030. We're never going to get there if we don't record the successes on um, private property. The benefits of Homegrown National Park is that it converts hope to action. You know, we've all heard about the problems forever, but now you get to do something, and it'll actually mean something. We don't rely on governmental support. We would love governmental support, but even if we don't get it, uh, we're still alive. And it merges existing conservation efforts. All the people in Audubon, all the people in National Wildlife Federation, and, and uh, the wild ones, they're all going to get on the map. And because it's free, we're not drawing members away from any of these organizations, uh, but we will get to record all of their successes in one aspirational so we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to join Homegrown National Park. What plants are we going to put in the area that we take out of lawn? I'm going to argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is? It's a stone in the middle of the arch, and if you take it out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. In other words, all natives are not equal in how they're contributing to food webs. So think of the keystone plants as the two by fours that are holding up the ecological house you're building at home. They're the support. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper, and that's what we've been trying to do for the last, last hundred years. You're not through building your, your ecological house when you have your keystone plants, but it's an essential first step. So the question is no longer simply, are, are natives ecologically better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of native species that aren't contributing all that much either. Uh, so the question really is, do we want to favor the plants that are contributing a whole bunch? The ones that are supporting the most pollinators and the most caterpillars or not? What is supporting the most caterpillars? It's one of our oak species. 84% of the counties in which they occur, they're supporting more species than any other plant genus. 557 species in the mid-Atlantic mid states, species of caterpillars, require oaks. Over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. And if you want to know what the best plants are in your county, you go to Native Plant Finder uh, National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the rank list of the most powerful plant genera, both woody plants and herbaceous plants, pop up for your county. Let's look at these herbaceous plants right here, goldenrod, um, native asters, and sunflowers, particularly perennial sunflowers. 
they're ranked at the top, not just because they make the most caterpillars. Sunflowers support 110 species of, of caterpillars, but because they support the most specialist bees. When we plant a pollinator garden, we want to plant the plants that the specialist bees need because the generalist bees can use those plants too. If we only focus on the generalist bees, we lose all those specialist bees. Uh, and goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers support, if you put those in your property right here, you'll have, you can have 44 species of bees that won't be there if you don't have those plants. So we're going to attract, uh, well, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to attract a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, <laughs> which of course is not the goal. Um, Studies have shown that light, produce, light pollution at night is one of the major factors causing insect decline uh, around the globe, but uh, certainly here. And those are all the ways that uh, insects are killed, particularly those moths that make the caterpillars that run our, our food web. Uh, but this is good news to me. It's good news because we've got to turn around insect decline. Not just stop it, we've got to turn around, we've got to have insect increases. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet. And they are the little things that, that run the world. If we can turn that around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. Not a lot of, lot of switches to flick, but we can be good at that. But I know what you're going to tell me. Well, I can't turn the light out over my barn or over my garage or over my front porch because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you realize is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, even easier, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED <coughs> works as well because yellow wavelengths are not attractive to nocturnal insects. So simply by switching out our lights uh, overnight, we could save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we could save millions of dollars too. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to use keystone plants. We're going to modify our light system. Then we're going to invite mosquito fogging company to come kill all our insects. <laughs> this is a booming business around the, around the country. Um, but they say it's okay because they're, what they're fogging with is a natural product, and it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids from chrysanthemums, which are in chrysanthemums to kill insects that eat chrysanthemums. It's industrial strength pyrethroids, but it is a natural product. But you know what? Cyanide is a natural product too. So I don't think that's a good argument. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. And I wish they were right, but they're not right. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with, which is all the insects. That includes your pollinators, it includes the monarchs we're trying to save, which by the way are now red listed according to the IUCN. There were a big monarch killed two, two years ago when they flew through Mosquito Joe, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground. The interesting thing is, the ironic thing is, it does not control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage, it's too hard. You have to kill 90% of them to get good control. <clears throat> Mosquito gel kills between 10 and 50%, so not even close to being effective. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Uh, using biocontrol is a great method. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put a handful of straw or hay in that bucket, and put it out in the sun for a couple of days. That builds up the population of diatoms and algae, and that's what mosquito larvae eat. So it becomes an irresistible brew to ovipositing mosquitoes. All the ones in your yard will go and they'll lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mosquito dunks. $9, $12. You put one of those dunks in your bucket, the larvae hatch, they eat the dunk and they die. That's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in, in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So if a dragonfly gets in there, it won't hurt it at all. If your dog drinks it, it won't hurt it at all. You might put a coarse screen over your bucket so your chipmunk doesn't commit suicide. <laughs> but it's cheap, it's targeted, and if everybody did it, it would, it would work a whole lot better than mosquito gel. And it wouldn't kill anything else. But here's another idea. If you're just going to use your yard once in a while in the afternoon or in the evening during mosquito season, get a fan and turn it on. It creates enough breeze that mosquitoes can't fly into it, and you don't have to kill anything. All right, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows those all-important caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? This is just an example, but I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the, the leaves, then it spins a cocoon, 
which hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them finish growing as caterpillars on the tree, then they drop from the tree, uh, and they wiggle their way beneath the soil surface and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree, and that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And we mow and compact our soil so it's rock hard during the summertime so the caterpillars can't get underground, which means the way we landscape typically becomes an ecological trap. The moths come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, drop down, and die. And I'm convinced this is another cause of insect declines around the country. Uh, and of course, the cement landscape is not the solution either. <laughs> this is what most people do. You've got a tree growing in a yard, and I've got a new grad student this, this year who's starting to measure how well caterpillars do in, in different types of, of landscapes. Um, but I guarantee they're going to do the best in a landscape like this, a, uh, a layered landscape. We have a tree, but then maybe a dogwood, and then maybe a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Soft landing, the caterpillar falls down, the ground is not compacted, it can easily get underground, nobody's going to step on it, nobody's going to mow it, plenty of leaf litter there, they can spin their cocoons, you'll have much higher survivorship. This is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn, you put beds around your trees. The bigger the better, they all become safe sites for those caterpillars. Use the uh, native ground covers liberally, things like uh, uh, wild ginger. Uh, this is native pachysandra. There's the Virginia creeper I talked about as a ground cover. Golden seal, may apples, uh, foam flower, ferns, there's lots and lots of examples. If you can see the ground, you don't have enough plants there. Green mulch is the way to go. Not, I can't tell whether it's licorice or whatever they call that. Uh, they're all safe sites for those categories. Okay, another former grad student, Desiree Narango, did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and the results of her study suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. She had one simple question. How well do chickadee populations do over time in residential landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by non-native plants? And when they're dominated by non-native plants, by non-native ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They're 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Everybody's got a nest box up, but the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Their clutches were 29% less likely to survive. If they did survive, those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that together in a population growth model, as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, from zero to 100%, this is what you get. A dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. And if you reproduce at that rate, you have a sustainable population. It can go on forever. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, above the line here, you've got a growing population, but if you make fewer babies, which happens when you've got a lot of non-native plants, you have an unsustainable shrinking population. Now right here is where those lines overlap, liberally speaking, which means you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying your local food web. We can't tolerate any of the invasive plants. No, no burning bush, no barberry because they're ecological tumors. They just keep growing and they don't stay in, in your yard. But there are a lot of ornamental plants that are not invasive. Remember Dan Getman, that's a ginkgo. Did you pick that up the first time? Why does he have a ginkgo in his native plant planting? Because Dan's wife likes ginkgos and said, Dan, plant a ginkgo. So he did. Is that plant destroying the functionality of this, this yard? No. Is it an invasive? Is it gonna escape and wreck the woodlot? No, it's just there. So I like to think of plants like that as if they are statues. So there's, there's Dan's game going. One or two is okay. One or two is okay. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of those productive native plants. If we increase the percentage of them, we can tolerate uh, plants that are not contributing much at all. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design taken by a drone 400 feet up. You don't get more formal than that, and every plant in that design is a native plant. 
design or formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. <laughs> Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little fence around it that formalizes it, that tells your neighbors not just a bunch of weeds you forgot to mow. <laughs> it's pretty when it's in bloom, it services uh, several species of bees. It's not very big, but if everybody did it, it would help. Help what? Help make pollinators. Why do we need pollinators? It's not because they pollinate a third of our crops, which you hear all the time. It's actually about a twelfth of our crops. And people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. We need pollinators, whether you live next to a farm or not, because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this, a Drew Latham design, much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help with live with nature? Yes, they can. More and more of them are doing it. Minnesota's been doing it for several years now. He's got a cost-sharing program that encourages homeowners to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. That's very, uh, um, very popular. Pennsylvania's got a lawn conversion program as well. You can look into that. Uh, you know, there's an island off of Florida where they're paying homeowners to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species, we're gonna pay you to take care of it, rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on, on invasive plants, things like calorie pear. That's what uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas has done, St. Louis, Missouri, South Carolina's banned them all together. I just heard that Pennsylvania's put them on the list to be, to be banned. North Carolina has a bounty on it. If you take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. Uh, utilities, what are utilities? You're giving people $100 coupons to plant water-efficient native plants instead of the thirsty non-natives. And of course, the big lawn conversion programs in, in the far west, particularly California, that's gone up. You now get $3 rebate per square foot of lawn that you remove and replace with uh, xeric planting. California doesn't have one drop of, of water to waste on lawn. And if you want more information on all of those uh, programs, memorize that. <laughs> All right, um, winding up here, I think we've, we've made three missteps in the, the uh, early years of conservation. We are in the early years of conservation. The first one is we're starting to think of, of nature as if it's optional. We like it, we like to visit it, we like to hike in it, but it's not essential. And if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, nature takes a back seat. And that certainly is what has happened. Went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the uh, virus broke out. And there's this wall-sized poster there that to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save nature, save wildlife, so that future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to save these wonderful places so that future generations can enjoy them. And I get that. Nature's enormously entertaining, but it's much more than entertaining. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation only to the areas where there's not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas are too few, too small, and too isolated. David Quammen has a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystem. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, and I don't like that, that language because it suggests that there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back. Not just to make biological corridors that connect viable habitats with each other, but to recreate viable habitats where we've destroyed them. We can do that, it's starting to happen, and when we do it, it'll be the first time in modern history that humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. 
for some reason, we didn't see conservation as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. But I don't know why, because every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So I want everybody to have the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems. Stan Reshworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset is I have rights. Mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. You are not born with those mindsets. You are taught those mindsets. We are good at teaching that one. We've been very poor at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, the, the, <laughs> a lot of people are recognizing the earth is in trouble. It's broken, as I heard earlier. Uh, and, but they feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can use keystone plants, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can change their light system, one person can remove the invasives that are already on their property. We didn't talk much about that. One person can put in a pollinator, did I say that? One person can fire Mosquito Joe. There's lots of things that one person can do to revitalize the ecosystem in their yard, which will then enhance their local ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems, you get depressed. Just think about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious, that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park, a preserve. They're all underfunded, they're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power, and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do so, is going to determine nature's fate, and then ultimately our own fate. And I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Shirley from Southern Lancaster County. What I want to know is when are you going to do a DVD of your talks? Because there, are, I have invited several people to this talk. They're all busy. They have things to do. But I would like to invite them to my living room to, to listen to your talk. And on YouTube, it takes time to uh, winnow out the talks. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, I'm the world's worst businessman. I have this DVD. How's that? How do I get it to you? How do I? You know, what's the mechanics of that? Those, it's little things like that that have stopped me from doing that. But that's a, that's a poor excuse, and I really should do it. Yes. One other option to offer is that all of you who registered will get a follow-up email. You're not being added to every organizations list, I promise, but you'll get a follow-up email that does have the link directly to this recording. So it will take you to a Highlands recording of today. Okay. Yes, that's why we record this, yes. Thank you for coming to us, Doc, really appreciate that. My name is Nancy and I live in uh, Northern York County, Monaghan Township, on about an acre and a half that's surrounded by hay fields and uh, separated from my problem is deer, and one plant that you showed there is a white turtle head. I have pink turtle head that, if I'm lucky, I'll see two blossoms uh, every year, because the deer adore it. So how do I deal with deer and uh, 
other foragers? Deer are a terrible problem from a number of perspectives. One that people don't think about is the, the terrible problem we have from invasive plants is largely because of deer. They chip, they, they shift the competitive advantage against our native plants. The deer don't like the invasives either. So every little oak tree or something that pops up, the deer eat it. And of course the, the burning bush and the autumn olive and the other things that the deer don't like take over. When you have deer exclosures, our native plants are pretty competitive. So that would help a lot just to have deer uh, populations under control. It's not the deer's fault, I get that, but they are between 10 and 14 times over the carrying capacity, over the ability to be sustained long-term in many places, actually across the country, but per particularly in this area, we have extremely high deer populations. Um, that's where, you wonder where Lyme disease come from? There wasn't no Lyme disease when I grew up. There were no deer ticks. I mean, it was there, but it was so rare that nobody even knew what it was. Well, the deer are part of the Lyme disease cycle, and now we've got way too many deers, and we've got, we've got serious Lyme disease problem. They are eating the forest, so we have no recruitment. Um, we've got all these invasive vines pulling down the trees, and no, no trees to replace them. So you do that for a couple generations of deer, and you've got no forest. Again, these are serious ecological problems. And the reason we don't control deer is not an ecological problem, it's a sociological problem. And it all came from watching Bambi. <laughs> it's true, people have studied that. <laughs> um, and I get it, uh, I, I understand that, but we know how to control deer. There are a couple ways. You, you put the predators back, I mean, that would do it. So we can, we can accept the bears and the wolves and the cougars, that would do it. Uh, right now, the only major predator in most places, the hunters aren't doing it, they're hunting out where there aren't any deer, is our cars. So insur insurance companies get that, that that's a problem. Um, so we either put the predators back or we become the predators our ourselves. We do have one predator, a minor predator, and that's the coyote that is now, now here. It will take fawns for just a few days, and what do we do? We, are, we have permission to shoot it on site, no matter what. Why? Because it's vermin. Why? Because we like doing that. I don't know, that's the only hope we have in having modest control and we, we are shooting that. So we gotta change our, our culture in relationship to, we talk about gardening the world. We're gardening the world, but we're also controlling populations all over the world. I had a student last, last year on a final exam who said, we talk about managing wildlife species, we really have to manage humans because they're the managers of wildlife species and how we manage them depends on how we manage human attitudes. That's what the deer problem is. Mm -hmm. I, I know I didn't answer it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, they're coming, they're running. Have you ever participated in a controlled burn to get rid of an, uh, alien species? I personally have not participated in a controlled burn. Uh, but you know, in the Midwest, they do controlled burns all the time. Um, controlled burns are a great way to uh, maintain a meadow or prairie situation over time. Uh, Longwood has now, they've got an 80-acre uh, meadow, uh, and they burn it. They used to burn it every single year, trying to control the oriental bittersweet and other invasives that are in there. It doesn't work, because burning does not kill the root system. It will keep the trees and things out, but the roots are there once you allow them to invade. Uh, and as soon as you stop burning, they come roaring back. So uh, if you're really trying to, to maintain a meadow, you've, you've got to get rid of the invasives when you start and then do spot treatment as they come in as, as little guys. Uh, either that or, it, because even the native woodies will come back and then it moves, moves through to a forest. It goes through succession. We get a lot of rain here. So the only thing that maintained meadows and, and uh, grasslands in the past were grazers. And, and we got rid of the grazers. We got rid of the wood bison. We got rid of the Pleistocene mammals. Uh, and the only grazer we have now is, is cattle, which can be used effectively if you don't overgraze. But, um, your question. Good. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah, sure. I'm Priscilla and I'm from here in Lancaster County. I am really worried about bacterial scorch mm -hmm. hitting my oaks. Mm -hmm. 
bacterial leaf scorch, oak wilt, sudden oak death syndrome, three major diseases of oaks that are terrorizing oaks around the country. All diseases that we have brought in, um, diseases that we move with, with ornamental stock. <coughs> uh, and you should be worried about bacterial leaf scorch. So people say, what's the solution? The solution is um, kind of a long-term solution. There is resistance to each one of those diseases in different species of oaks. So what we need to do is rather than try to save the susceptible trees, which is just about impossible, you can spend a lot of money and in the end they die anyway, favor the ones that are resistant. So at my, my house, I've lost two black oaks and two red oaks so far to bacterial leaf scorch. But I've got a bunch that aren't, are fine. They're not touched. They're the ones that are gonna drop the acorns that the, that the blue jays will, will disperse. So it won't take that long to repopulate our forest with the resistant genotypes. This has been happening with dogwood and thracnose. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, all our dogwoods were, were dying. Well, most of the ones you see now are resistant and, and it didn't take all that long. So, you know, I don't have any other solution other than to ignore your, your arborist or forester who says, don't plant any more oaks, they'll get sick. Plant more oaks than ever so that we can, it's, it's a selection experiment. We're selecting the ones that are going to survive. Some will get sick, many will get sick, and we cut them down, that's okay. Then we have firewood. But, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do I know breeders? No, I don't. Um, the trouble is that oak generation is pretty long. You know, these diseases are recent. So uh, oaks don't produce acorns until they're at least 20 years old. Uh, so no, I don't know of anybody who's doing it, but it's happening naturally. So um, is, is there a question I can answer? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, my name's Sean, I live in the city. Uh, the only yard that I have is a raised bed. Um, I'm interested if there's any, I know I've talked to other uh, climate activists or ecologists who talk about the importance of our uh, you know, food systems and you know, urban and suburban gardening or you know, local and regenerative agriculture. I'm wondering if you have any insights about what sort of food choices we can make support our native ecosystems. Um, you know, that is, that is literally talking about apples and oranges. Uh, our food mostly is non-native plants. We're not going to restore biodiversity by changing what we eat. Now, we do have native things we eat. We can eat black walnuts, and we can eat persimmons, and we can eat uh, uh, pawpaws, and <laughs> none of which we're gonna you know, uh, exist on. So you can add that to your thing. But, but I think locally grown food is great. You can have your, your uh, urban and suburban gardens, but it's, it's, diff it's a different use of that piece of your yard. Can you put native plants in too? Yes, but you can't block all your sun because you need sun for, for agriculture. So there's a lot of good things associated with local gardening, local uh, farming. Um, no transportation, you get to control what poisons you put on your food. Uh, but it's a, it's a different goal for our landscapes than restoring uh, native plants. So I don't, you know, a little bit of competition in terms of space, but I think we can do both. I know we can do both. He's not running. <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned uh, in preserving a meadow to remove the invasives that you could do spot elimination. Is there any way to do that easily or do you have to just go out and pull it? Because you know, if you're looking at a couple acres, that's a daunting task. It is. I didn't show you pictures of what our property looked like. Uh, you know, it was mowed for hay, but they stopped mowing three years before we moved in. So you know what came back. It was all the rootstocks of Multiflora Rose and Oriental Bittersweet and, and Autumn Olive. 10 acres, my wife got rid of all of it. It's a lot of work, you're right. Uh, and then you have to be vigilant because it keeps wanting to, to come back. So I don't want to minimize the investment. Fortunately, she was willing to do that. But I've got a picture of skinny old little Cindy there doing it, which shows you it is, it is possible. Once you have it under control, that's when the spot treatment really makes sense. Um, because, because they're little guys. You've got to do it you know, once a year in the spring, you, you, or as soon as they start to leaf out. Uh, and it's easier, much easier to, to control at that point. 
But you know, it's, it's kind of satisfying. You have a, a great big field of autumn olive or multiflora rose. You get under there, you saw them off at the base, and you make this big pile of bodies. It's, <laughs> it feels very satisfying. Okay, so there's no All easy right, thanks. Right, thanks. thanks very much. Okay. Again, thank you for joining us at Highland. It was wonderful to have you all here. Uh, our partners are still at their tables, I believe. Uh, Doug will be at his table with uh, his, some of his books. Uh, you're welcome to, to take a look at. Uh, and I'll mention again our uh, baskets for free will offering. They're just outside the doors. They are Easter baskets because that represents new hope and new life. Uh, after so much desolation. But please enjoy your Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much from all of us at Highland for being here.